It is Jesus' last meal with his disciples, and he is doing what he can to prepare them not only for his imminent death, but also for life after his resurrection and ascension. His disciples are anxious, confused, uncertain, and so, as he often did, Jesus uses the familiar things of earth to describe heavenly truths. In this case, a grapevine, its branches and fruit, and the careful tending of a vine grower. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. And then, having described the relationships between God and himself and the disciples in this way, Jesus goes on to name that which binds them together, love. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Love. That word can mean so many things. Just saying it brings all kinds of images to mind. The gleeful hug of a child, emojis in a text message, the sloppy lick of a dog's tongue on one's cheek, the bouquet I received yesterday from our daughter and son-in-law, a passionate kiss, the satisfying taste of a favorite food, the words of a song, love. The question is, what does Jesus mean when he talks about love? First of all, the love of which Jesus speaks finds its source not in Jesus himself, but in God. 1 John 4, 8 asserts that God is love, and Jesus makes it clear that his love for the disciples derives from the love of God that he enjoys, that the relationship that they share with him mirrors his own relationship with God. Knowing the challenges that they are about to face, Jesus urges them to abide, to remain, to stay in that love. He knows that without the support and strength of God's love, they will not survive the shock and devastation of his loss. He knows that like the branch of a vine, they must continue to experience the love of God that they receive through him in order to carry on his work, even after he is no longer there to teach encourage and guide them. How is this possible? His answer is surprising. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. If you keep my commandments, that statement makes it sound as if the disciples have to earn Jesus' love with their obedience, but I don't think that he intends it that way. As David Lowe's points out, we can't just love one another without some surrender of our will. Or to put it another way, when you love, it's no longer all about you. Real love necessitates some kind of sacrifice, a sacrifice which Jesus has himself made and will make. But then hear the promise in Jesus' words, the result of such obedience is an abiding relationship and also joy, a full, rich joy. Bear in mind that Jesus is not talking about obedience for its own sake. He's not suggesting that we should give in to coercive power that masquerades as love. The kind of obedience of which Jesus speaks is a glad response to his own self-giving love, love that is rooted in the love of God, obedience that gives rise to joy. And what is the commandment that the disciples are to obey? This is my commandment, Jesus tells them, 
that you love one another as I have loved you. If these words sound familiar, it's because this is the second time that Jesus had said them in the Gospel of John. The first is found in chapter 13 when Jesus says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, however, Jesus goes on to make the meaning of his words explicit. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. As Emily Askew notes, love in this passage is not a psychological state, nor is it anywhere described as an internal quality. Love is an action, a really difficult action. Difficult indeed. It may be helpful to know that friendship in that culture, of that, in the culture of that time, meant a lot more than just being a good buddy. To be someone's friend was serious business. According to Gail O'Day, those who read this gospel for the first time would not be surprised by Jesus' words, for they would understand a friend to be someone who loved another enough to be willing to give their all for them. The difference, as O'Day points out, is that Jesus doesn't just talk about laying down his life. He does it, making this friendship, this deep love incarnate in his own life and death. I'm reminded of Paul's words in Romans 5, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul, make, Paul makes a good point. While I believe that most of us would be willing to lay down our lives for our children or our spouse, I'm not sure that would be the case for a friend. If that is the kind of love that Christ offers his disciples and to which he calls them, and us. Knowing this, I suspect that Jesus' next words absolutely astonished his disciples. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call your ser you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Again, we are sent back to chapter 13, this time to Jesus' washing of disciples' feet, after which he says, So if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, servants are not greater than their master. In the Greek, this is even stronger, for the word servant is, in actuality, slave. For Jesus to name his disciples friends, then, is a huge shift in their relationship. Mind you, Jesus is not telling his disciples that he's now their BFF. He remains their teacher and Lord. Still, at the very time when they are feeling least secure and will soon abandon him, George Ramsey writes, Christ grants them the dignity and the responsibility of being friends. Even knowing that they will not, in fact, be willing to die for him, Jesus calls them his friends. It is a, an amazing gift of love. They are his friends, Jesus tells his disciples, because he has shared all that he has heard from his father with them, thereby drawing them into the intimacy of his relationship with God. The implication of this statement is again astounding. To be friends with Jesus is to be invited into friendship with God. That Intimacy will continue with the coming of the Holy Spirit as Jesus will tell his disciples in chapter 16. 
I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. As Jesus goes on, he further defines the nature of this friendship. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Think about what it's like to realize that someone whom we like and admire actually wants to be our friend, to be with us and to know us intimately. It's such a gift and yes, a joy. Imagine then how the disciples felt on hearing these words. Imagine what it might be like to hear Jesus speak these words to you. You are my friend. Sit with that a moment. Jesus' next words circle back to the image of the vine and the branches, reminding the disciples that friendship with Jesus brings with it a responsibility, and at the same time assuring them that they will not go it alone. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Then one last time he says, I am giving you these commands, so that you may love one another. Our church's vision statement begins in this way. Following the example of Jesus Christ, El Segundo United Methodist Church seeks to be a community of faith that embodies the love of God. To embody something is to make it tangible, to make it visible, to enable others to experience it. To embody the love of God, then, is to do what Christ did, to live as he lived, to love and befriend others as he loved and befriended his disciples. That's a big order, but not one that's impossible in Christ. And it begins with the realization that God seeks to be in relationship with us, that God loves each one of us. We see this in the relationship that Jesus shared his, with his disciples, a relationship as close as that of a vine and branches, an abiding, ongoing, living relationship of mutuality and friendship. What a friend we have in Jesus, we will sing shortly. A friend who bears our sins and sorrows, who knows our every weakness and yet remains our friend. A faithful friend who is our refuge, our shield and solace. A friend who gives his life for us, who shares with us the will and word of God and who promises us joy. This is the love that God offers us in Jesus. No strings attached accept the obligation to accept that love in faith. This is a love whose promises we can trust. Thanks be to God. One important caveat. The love that we share is not just for us, not ours to hoard. We are, in fact, called to produce fruit, to make God's love in Christ tangible, so plain to see that others will be drawn into relationship with him. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If we truly love one another, that love cannot help but spill over into the lives of other people. Here again, we need have to be a little careful, for the temptation is to focus solely on withers, winning others to Christ for the sake of the church. But Jesus does not call us to bear, build up an institution. He calls us to bear fruit. 1 John 3, 17 through 18 may help us with this. It says, 
How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or deed, but in truth and action. And indeed, that is exactly what Jesus did. He loved in truth and action, risking all to alleviate suffering and to bring hope to the hopeless. Cornell West once said, justice is the shape love takes into society. To embody the love of God then is also to love in the same way that Christ did, striving to end suffering, to ensure that everyone has a place at the table to bear the fruit of justice. Surely this kind of love is needed in our broken world now more than ever. And as we look toward meeting again within the walls of these sanctuary, this sanctuary, I hope and pray that we are also thinking about how we will share God's love beyond these walls with others who are not with us in this room. It is a high and hard calling, this command to love. That is why we need to turn again and again to the promises of Christ, the promise of a mutual relationship of love with God, the promise of the Spirit's ongoing support, and the promise of joy. Thanks be to God for the love that ensures these promises. Amen.